Hello Year 2 and today Miss Turner is back at school. You can see we're in Fox's lovely book corner and missing this environment a lot. It was very weird to be back just only for one day and without the whole class here. So I miss you all terribly and um, yeah, I can't wait to get back to normal. But uh, I hope you're all enjoying yourselves at home and you're carrying on with your learning as much as you can. So, chapter five of Charlie the Great Glass Elevator, Men from Mars. When last we saw the group, because it's a few days ago now, uh, we know that they were heading towards the Great Space Hotel and we know that the United States of America was avidly watching and the uh, President of the United States was ringing up countries like China and Russia to find out who was on board and who they thought was going to blow up their new hotel. And they currently think that our intrepid explorers, Charlie and his gang, are actually on board to blow up the Great Space Hotel. There was no floating inside the Space Hotel. <clears throat> the Gravity Maker machine saw to that. So once the docking had been triumphantly achieved, Mr Wonka, Charlie, Grandpa Joe and Mr and Mrs Bucket were able to walk out of the Great Glass Elevator into the lobby of the hotel. As for Grandpa George, Grandma Georgina and Grandma Josephine, none of them had had their feet on the ground for over 20 years and they certainly weren't going to change their habits now. So when the floating stopped, they all three plopped right back into bed again and insisted that the bed with them in it be pushed into the space hotel. Charlie gazed around the huge lobby. On the floor, there was thick green carpet 20 tremendous chandeliers hung shimmering from the ceiling and the walls were covered with valuable pictures and there were big soft armchairs all over the place. At the far end of the room there were doors of five lifts and the group stared in silence at all of this luxury. Nobody dared speak. Mr Wonka had warned them that every word that they uttered would be picked up by space control in Houston so they had better be careful. A faint humming noise came from somewhere below the floor, but that only made the silence more spooky. Charlie took hold of Grandpa Joe's hand and held it very tight. He wasn't sure he liked this very much. They had broken into the greatest machine ever built by man, the property of the United States government, and if they were discovered and captured, as they surely must be in the end, what would happen to them then? Jail for life? Yes, or something worse. Mr Wonka was writing on a little pad. He held up the pad. It said, anybody hungry? The three old ones on the bed began waving their arms and nodding and opening and shutting their mouths. Mr Wonka turned the paper over and on the other side it said, the kitchens of this hotel are loaded with luscious food, lobsters, steaks, ice cream. We shall have a feast to end all feasts. Hmm, who of you out there think he's really not very good, Mr Wonka? Because then that's stealing, isn't it? Taking other people's things knowing they don't belong to you. Suddenly, a tremendous booming voice came out of a loudspeaker hidden somewhere in the room. Attention! Boomed the voice and Charlie jumped. So did Grandpa Joe. Everybody, in fact, jumped except Mr Wonka. Attention, the eight foreign astronauts. This is Space Control in Houston, Texas, US of A. You are trespassing on American property. You are ordered to identify yourselves immediately. Speak now. Shh, whispered Mr Wonka, fingers to lips. There followed a few seconds of awful silence. Nobody moved except Mr Wonka who kept going, shh. Who are you? Boomed the voice from Houston and the whole world heard it. I repeat, who are you? shouted the urgent, angry voice, and 500 million people crouched in front of their television screens, waiting for an answer to come from the mysterious strangers inside the space hotel. The television was not able to show a picture of these mysterious strangers. Only the words came through. The TV watchers saw nothing but the outside of the giant hotel in orbit, photographed, of course, by Shuckworth, Shanks and Showler, who were following behind. And for half a minute, the world waited for reply. But none came. Speak, boomed the voice, getting louder and louder and ending in a fearful, frightening shout that rattled Charlie's eardrums. Speak, speak, speak. 
Grandma Georgina shot under the sheet. Grandma Josephine stuck her fingers in her ears. Grandpa George buried his head in the pillow. Mr and Mrs Bucket, both petrified, were once again in each other's arms. Charlie was clutching Grandpa Joe's hand and the two of them were staring at Mr Wonka and begging him with their eyes to do something. Mr Wonka stood very still and although his face looked calm, you can be quite sure his clever little inventive brain was spinning like a dynamo. This is your last chance, boomed the voice. We are asking you to once more, who are you? Reply immediately. If you do not reply, we shall be forced to regard you as dangerous enemies. We shall then press the emergency freezer switch and the temperature in the space hotel will drop to minus 100 degrees centigrade. All of you will be instantly deep frozen. You will have 15 seconds to speak. After that, you will turn into icicles. One, two, three. Grandpa, whispered Grant Charlie as the counting continued. We must do something. Quick, we must. Six, said the voice. Seven, sounds like me counting for lining up. Eight, nine. Mr. Wonka had not moved. He was still gazing straight ahead, still quite cool, perfectly expressionless. Charlie and Grandpa Joe were staring at him in horror. Then all at once they saw the tiny, twinkling wrinkles of a smile appear around the corner of his eyes and he sprang into life. He spun around on his toes, skipped a few paces across the floor and then in a frenzied, unearthly sort of scream he cried, Fimble Fees! The loudspeaker stopped counting. There was silence all over the world. There was silence. Charlie's eyes were riveted on Mr Wonka. He was going to speak again. He was taking a deep breath. Bungle Booney! He screamed. What is he up to? There he is. Crazy Mr Wonka. He put so much force into his voice that the effort lifted him right up onto the top of his toes. Bungle Booney! Duffo Dooney! Jubilone! Again, the silence. The next time Mr. Wonka spoke, the words came out so fast and sharp and loud, they were like bullets from a machine gun. Zong, 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 zong! He barked. The noise echoed around and around the lobby of the space hotel, and it echoed around the world. Mr. Wonka now turned to face the far end of the lobby where the loudspeaker voice had come from. He walked a few paces forward as a man would, perhaps, who wanted a more intimate conversation with his audience and this time the tone was much quieter the words came more slowly but there was a touch of steel in every syllable Kerasuko Malibuko we be ways on you be cuckoo Alipenda Kakamenda Pantsfolden Infonospenda Fukiki Candiriki we be stronger, you be weaker. Popocotta, borrow mocha. Very risky, you provoker. Canty catty, moons and stars. Fan fanishal, Venus Mars. Mr. Wonka paused dramatically for a few seconds, then he took an enormous deep breath in a wild and fearsome voice. He called out, Catty mi bimbi zunk. Fomboli zi zunk. Gugu mi za zunk. Fumikaka, zunk, anapolala, zunk, zunk, zunk. The effect of all this on the world below was electric. In the control room in Houston, in the White House, in Washington, in palaces and cities, buildings and mountain shacks from America to China to Peru, the 500 million people who heard that wild and fearsome voice yelling out these strange and mystic words all shivered with fear before their television sets. Everybody began turning to everybody else and saying, who are they, what language is that, where do they come from? In the President's study in the White House, Vice President Tibbs, the members of the Cabinet, the Chiefs of the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Sword Swallow from Afghanistan, the Chief Financial Advan Advisor, and Mrs. Tobsipus, the cat, all stood rigid and tense. They were very much afraid, but the President himself kept a cool head and a clear brain. Nanny, he cried. Oh, Nanny, what on earth will we do now? I'll get you a nice warm glass of milk, said Miss Tibbs. I hate the stuff, said President. Please don't make me drink it. Some of the chief interpreter, said Miss Tibbs. Some of the chief interpreter, said the president. Where is he? There we go. There we are. Miss Tibbs looks fearsome, doesn't she? I don't know if I'd want her as my nanny. Right here, Miss President, said the chief interpreter. 
What language is that creature spouting up there in the space hotel? Be quick, was it Eskimo? Not Eskimo, Miss President. Ha! Then it was Tagalog. Either Tagalog or Ugro. Not Tagalog, Miss President. Not Ugro either. Was it Tulu then, or Tugus or Tupi? Definitely not Tulu, Mr. President. Now I'm quite sure it wasn't Tungus or Tupi. Don't stand there telling me what it wasn't, you idiot, said Miss President. Miss Tibb said, tell him what it was. Yes, ma'am, Mr. Vice President, ma'am, said the Chief Interpreter, beginning to shake. Believe me, Mr. President, he went on, it was not the language I've ever heard before. But I thought you knew every language in the world. I do, Mr. President. Don't lie to me, Chief Inspector. How, Chief Interpreter, rather. How can you possibly know every language in the world when you don't know this one? It's not a language of this world, Mr. President. Nonsense, ma'am, barked Miss Tibbs. I understood some of it myself. These people, Miss Vice President, ma'am, have obviously tried to learn just a few of our easier words, but the rest of it is a language that's never been heard before on this earth. Screeping scorpions, cried the President. You mean to tell me they could be coming from... From somewhere else? Precisely, Mr. President. Like where, said the President. Who knows, said the Chief Interpreter. But did you not notice, Mr. President, how they use the words Venus and Mars? Of course I noticed it, said Mr. President. But what's that got to do with it? Aha! I see what you're driving at. Good gracious me, men from Mars. And Venus, said the Chief Interpreter. That, said the President, would make for trouble. I say, Kurt, said the Chief Interpreter. He wasn't talking to you, said Miss Tibbs. What do we do now, General, said the President. Blow him up, cried the General. You're always wanting to blow things up, said the President crossly. Can't you think of something else? I like blowing things up, said the General. It makes such a lovely noise. Woomph, woomph. Don't be a fool, said Miss Tibbs. You blow these people up, Master declare war on us. So will Venus. Quite right, Nanny, said the President. We be truculated like turkeys, every one of us. We be mashed like potatoes. Ah, take him on, shouted the Chief of the Army. Shut up, shouted Miss Tibbs. You're fired. Hooray, said all the other generals. Well done, Miss Vice President, ma'am. Miss Tibbs said, we've got to treat these fellows gently. The one who spoke just now sounded extremely cross. We've got to be polite to them, bunch them up, make them happy. The last thing we want is to be invaded by men from Mars. you got to talk to them, Mr. President. Tell Houston we want another radio direct link with the Space Hotel. And hurry. Ooh. And we'll find out. Chapter 6, an invitation to the White House. All tomorrow. Take care. Have a lovely evening. And I'll see you tomorrow, year two.